The orthodox idea in the 17th century was that there are two kinds of colours, real and imaginary. Real colours actually exist in the world, like those of paints. Imaginary colours, like those of the rainbow, don't really exist. They're the effects of our minds. But some natural philosophers began to argue that no, all colours are imaginary. All colours are made the way the rainbow is, so if you could understand the rainbow, you could understand the origin of colour. You can reproduce the effects of the rainbow with glass prisms, so prisms became the chief instrument for investigating the origin of colour. This is a work by the great French philosopher René Descartes. Um, it's in the edition that Isaac Newton would have read at Trinity College in his early 20s. And on the left-hand page is an image by Descartes of the way in which the rainbow is made. Sunlight passes through water droplets, it's bent, and as it bends, it produces in the eye of the beholder a coloured image that we see as a rainbow. And what Descartes then does decisively is to see if it's possible to reproduce that phenomenon using a triangular glass prism. Pass sunlight through the leading edge of the prism and allow the light to bend through the prism, it will cast a series of coloured images on a screen just below the prism. So what Newton was learning in reading this kind of work was that it was possible to use prisms as experimental instruments. He did the same with this book by the most eminent and famous of experimenters in England at the time, Robert Boyle, who published this book on light and colour in 1664. And Boyle here uh, provides another diagram of the way in which light can be bent through a glass prism and produce some kind of coloured image. When Newton reached Trinity as a student in the early 1660s, he began to keep a series of manuscript notebooks which still survive and record in amazing detail the kinds of experiments and readings in which he was engaged. So we know that in his early 20s, he acquired from local fairs glass prisms. They were not taken seriously as scientific objects. They were called fool's paradises. And what Newton did was to uh, paint onto a piece of card, one half red, the other blue. And then he'd look at the card through a prism. And what he noticed was that the two colours, when you look at the red and blue together, the two colours separate. This began to suggest to him that there was a relationship between our imagination, the glass prism, and the colour-making rays of light coming from the card. So what he then did was to see if his own imagination could produce colours. He took a wooden bodkin, a kind of needle, and he stuck it between his eyeball and the bone and pushed. And as he pushed, he noted that he could start to see rings of colour. Rings of colour that strongly resembled the kind of colours that are produced when light passes through a prism. He would stare at the sun and then close his eyes and summon up in his imagination the coloured images that sunlight directly onto his eye produced. What these experiments suggested was that there was a profound relation between our imagination and the way light interacts somehow with the glass prism when it's shone through the instrument. He was turning glass prisms, fool's paradises, into scientific equipment.
1665, the college closed because of the plague and Newton left for his family home at Woolsthorpe. And it was probably at Woolsthorpe in Lincolnshire that he carried out the next important set of experiments on light and colour, which are recorded in this set of manuscripts that he calls Of Colours. What he did now was to build a pinhole camera. According to the official philosophy of the time, the eye works like a pinhole camera. In other words, it works as if it's a box with a tiny hole drilled through one wall, let light in through that wall, and an image, a reliable, accurate image, is cast on the wall opposite the hole. So what Newton did was to turn his own room into a pinhole camera. Since the eye behaved just like a pinhole camera, what Newton was doing was arranging things so, as it were, he was doing experiments inside his own eye. So what he did was to put shutters across the window and then drill a tiny hole through the shutters to let in the sunlight. And then he took a glass prism and he intercepted the sunlight with the prism. He arranged the prism so that the sunlight passed through it symmetrically and cast an image about 22 feet away on the opposite wall. Now under those circumstances, you would expect the shape of the hole to be the same as the shape of the image, a little circle, but it wasn't. Instead, the image on the wall spread out like an oval. What that must mean, Newton reckoned, was that different rays bend at different angles through the glass prism. And what he concluded was that different colour-making rays each have their own specific angle of refraction. What a glass prism had done in Newton's hands was to split up white light into its component colours. With a prism, the mystery of the origin of colour, so Newton reckoned, had been solved. Now this had one very intriguing implication, which Newton began to exploit, not only in his notebooks, but also in the lectures that he was commissioned to give when he became the Professor of Mathematics in Cambridge in the mid-1660s. One of the rules of his professorship was that he was to deposit copies of his lectures in the university library. We still have a copy of these lectures. This is a copy made probably in the autumn of 1671, and it records in increasing detail, in Latin as you see, um, the details of experiments that prove his theory of light and colour. It describes coloured images in a word that mattered a great deal to Newton, a word he invented, spectrum, taken from the Latin word for ghost. Because for Newton, colours are made as though they were effects of the gazing of the human, of the human mind. They are spectral objects. So it's from Newton that we get the idea that these coloured images form a spectrum. But what Newton threw himself into in the late 1660s was a problem with existing astronomical instruments. The most important astronomical instrument, the telescope developed by Galileo in the early 1600s, relied on lenses to achieve its magnification. In other words, it depended on passing sunlight or starlight through glass. And what Newton had shown is if that happens, you inevitably produce a spectrum. In other words, what Newton was saying was that in lens telescopes, in refracting telescopes, the image will always be deformed by colour. So he designed a completely different form of telescope, a telescope that relies not on lenses, but on mirrors, a reflecting telescope, where the problem of the coloured image can be avoided. And in collaboration with London optical instrument makers, Newton designed a new kind of telescope. He reported this to the Royal Society in London, 
and after a series of exchanges, was asked to send the Royal Society an account of the experiments on which he'd made this absolutely remarkable invention of a reflecting telescope. So in February of 1672, Newton sent to London a detailed but reconstructed account of the experiments on light and colour with prisms that were recorded in his manuscript notebooks. And from then on, for six or seven years, Newton became embroiled in a series of fights with other fellows of the Royal Society, notably Robert Hooke, about the legitimacy of his theory, the accuracy of his experiments, and what he'd done with prisms. So what is wonderful about having access now to the manuscripts and the notebooks that Newton kept of his work on light and colour in the 1660s, when he was in his 20s, is that we can go behind the published record and accurately reconstruct the details and the order of the extraordinary work he constructed in Cambridge and in Woolsthorpe to show his new theory of light and colour. <laughs>